Well, good day, everyone, everywhere, and special greetings to all those seated in heavenly places in Jesus, our Messiah. The name of this broadcast is Cross the Border, and my name is Nicholas, and today is our weekly uh, Prophecy Reality Edition. Uh, we have the studio cam on, so if you're listening live, come on over to the FirstAmendmentRadio.com chat room. Uh, click on the chat button there and join the conversation. Uh, first hour, we've got some uh, news items to talk about, uh, uh, and but we have your questions, comments, uh, whatever you'd like to add. Um, I'll be keeping my eye on the chat room so we can uh, interact that way. And in the second hour, we're going to uh, continue going through uh, history unveiling prophecy. Uh, we'll be doing uh, segment uh, 23 of that book, so you'll want to stick around for that. Our scripture verse for the day is Revelation chapter 11, verse 1. And there was a reed. And there was given me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God, and the altar, and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple, leave out and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread under foot forty and two months. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days clothed in sackcloth. Okay, the uh, we're celebrating the 500th anniversary, anniversary of the Protestant Reformation. And the Reformers saw themselves in the pages of the Revelation, and specifically these pages that I just read, or these uh, few verses that I just read. Well, well, much more than that, but basically the, they saw themselves. There is a temple scene here in verse 11, and I believe that the Reformers rightly divided, rightly judged that this temple scene was figurative of the church, because that's what the Revelation is all about. The Revelation starts out with the church, with Jesus himself speaking to the churches, uh, admonishing them, building them up, and warning them, and uh, promising them rewards if they're obedient. And then you'll find these rewards sprinkled throughout the entire Revelation. And there's some, you know, the futurists, they say, well, the church is at the beginning, and then it doesn't show up until chapter, you know, 20 or something like that. I, I forget what they say. But if that's true, then Jesus was lying in his letters to each of the churches, because those promises that he made are sprinkled throughout the entire Revelation. The entire Revelation is to the church, and rightly divided, this temple scene is not the picture of a rebuilt temple in the future, uh, as in the left behind rapture eschatology, but it is a picture of the church. And the reformers saw themselves in this picture of the church. They saw themselves, they were given a rod to measure, to judge the church. And the court that was without, the it says, is given unto the Gentiles. These are the unbelievers. These are this is the nominal church, the church in name only. This is where the apostates are. And it says, and we see we have the two time periods given here. And the holy city shall they tread underfoot. Forty and two months. Now the holy city is representative of the church of God. We are the holy city. The church, the people of God, are the holy city. So if the holy city, they shall tread under foot 40 and 2 months, well, this is the 1260-year period. 
witnessed again by being mentioned again in the very next verse. And I will give power to my two witnesses. Two witnesses, two being the absolute minimum number of witnesses required according to the Old Testament. Let everything be established by two or more witnesses. And they shall prophesy. This is the, and some people say, well, this is the, the eastern line and the western line. And well, I, I could ag agree with that too, that these are a line of witnesses in the eastern and western uh, part of the Roman Empire. And they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth, showing that the state of their prophesying. And of course, to prophesy is to test, is the true testimony of Jesus Christ. And that's what the pre Reformation and the Reformation Church did. They prophesied, they testified of Jesus, and they kept his commandments, as is the mark of all of those who do not receive the mark of the beast. Okay, yeah, let me uh, let me check on the chat room here and see uh, if we got anybody in the chat room. No, I have it here somewhere. Ah, Naughty Pines, uh, good morning to you, Naughty Pines, Blue Raven. Uh, far out, Al and, uh, Al and Wacky is back and he says, what happened to CFF? Well, he's either sleeping in or he's working. <laughs> so he always shows up there to go, did I miss it? Did I miss it? Well, anyway. Um, well, not a whole a big audience. I guess everyone's, um, everyone's still in bed from partying last night over the, uh, the Reformation Day, right? Uh, or Halloween, if you're in the world, or or you can have the Christianized Halloween. What do they call it? Harvest Festival. Uh, so I brought it up to a church that I was attending uh, 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 the, recently. That uh, they should have a, a they should celebrate Reformation Day rather than uh, a Harvest Festival. Hey, they didn't listen to me. Anyway, here we are in the first day of the 501st year of the Protestant Reformation. And we're, we're getting to the day of Christ. It's coming along, well, sometime, uh, if I live long enough, in my lifetime. Uh, and I have a posting on my website, if you haven't seen that, uh, what year is it? Uh, you should check that out. And uh, we see that from the scripture, a timeline that we've developed out of the Bible itself, uh, naming every chapter and verse that we use in the Bible to get us to that timeline. Um, we see that the seventh millennium from creation will begin about 2055. Uh, I don't know the day or the year or the hour of the day or whatever. I know that it's about that time. Um, don't really care. It doesn't really matter that much if I'm a year off. Either way, <laughs> uh, I do know that uh, that God gave Israel uh, a timeline uh, to the year that the that Jesus was going to show up, that their Messiah would appear on the scene, and He did. At 30 years old, He He reached the requirement under the law uh, to be to be and act as a priest and to make a sacrifice. Of course, He was going to sacrifice himself, and he went about in his 30th year and began to preach the gospel. Repent, for the kingdom is at hand. And of course, we know that three and a half years later, in the midst of Daniel's 70th week, he put an end to the sacrifice and oblation by the sacrifice of himself. This is historical fact. Now, you can believe historical fact, uh, you know, you can believe that, you know, history uh, fulfilling prophecy, or you can believe the future is fantasy. To see the the total speculation about what they say is going to happen in the future, that Daniel's seventieth week, well, yeah, they had to put a gap in there, of course, and uh, of course they had to add the gap. I mean, otherwise it wouldn't work. 
Uh, but they added it. It's not in the scripture. Hmm. Ah, there's CFF. Good morning, CFF. He says, man, we have wacky and far out at the same time. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, I guess we have to all be a little wacky and a little far out to ignore what's popular in the church and, uh, you know, ignore what's happening out there in the court of the Gentiles. You know, the, what is popular in the visible church and earth? Or of course, the, the most popular thing right now is the Antichrist because, you know, he is the Christ of, uh, almost two billion people on earth. I mean, that's how big the, the apostate Antichrist church is. And I recognize it for what it is because the Catholic Church, with its head, the uh, the vicar of Christ, is the apostate church and the man of sin and has been for, uh, well, over 500 years. It has been recognized by the church up until about, oh, 150 years or ago or so about there that futurism started gaining ground. Of course, all built upon the uh, uh, the thesis of uh, the Jesuit Francisco Ribera and his counter-reformation eschatology of the end-time Antichrist. Of course, to vindicate uh, the man of sin sitting on the throne at the Vatican. You know, had to vindicate him. You know, I mean, if you're part of the apostasy, well, you cannot believe that your man is the Antichrist, the man of sin, so you have to come up with a thesis to vindicate him. Well, that thesis uh, over the hundreds of years that have uh, uh, that have preceded uh, until today has been built upon that wall of false prophecy as proclaimed in Ezekiel's day. Uh, they built upon this wall of false prophecy to where now most of the church believes it because most of the church is in the outer court of the Revelation temple scene. And, you know, I just released a, uh, uh, redid and released a publication on my website, crosstheborder.org. Uh, the Reformation in the Revelation 500 year anniversary. So take, uh, take advantage of that video and enjoy it. Uh, we also have that on, um, Amazon Prime. So if you got an Amazon Prime account, uh, look it up there. It's called The Reformation Rises on Amazon Prime, but so look up The Reformation Rises and watch it there. Uh, but anyway, enjoy that. It's all about the Reformation and the Revelation. And, and this is borrowed from mostly E.B. Elliott and H. Grattan Guineas. Uh, we put together, I put together some stuff from both of those books from both of those authors to put this presentation together. So I hope that uh, you'll enjoy that. Let me put that on the desktop so you can see that on my website there. Uh, the Reformation in the Revelation. Yeah, do enjoy that. Okay. Oh, I have some news items. Uh, Michael is uh, out working today <laughs> in Florida. He's he's staying with his mother. She's uh She's in her 80s, so uh, she needs some help. So he went back there to help her, and, and he's back to uh, doing riding his bicycle and doing home improvement work and, and odd jobs for people. I didn't think he could do that on a bicycle, but I'll uh, leave it to Michael. He can do it, and uh, he makes a fantastic salad, too. Uh, I miss his salads. <laughs> of course, uh, since he's left, I've been eating a lot more salads, so uh, he's had a good effect on me. Ah, the news items. Let's see. Um, let's go ahead and put these on the uh, screen here, too, so you can check. Oh, is this some 500-year uh, Catholic and Protestant leaders unite to mark the start of the Reformation? The great usurper is at work. <laughs> he even has to usurp, you know, uh, what... But Luther, see, he discovered Christ, and in his discovery of Christ, he came the discovery of Antichrist. So, you know, they ain't going to talk about that too much. 
Archbishop of Canterbury uses service to present joint declaration described as sign of healing after 500 years of division. <laughs> How is that? Well, we're going to start uh, irregular confession and transubstantiation and worshiping uh, saints in the Protestant church now? Um, has has the, the great apostate church given up all of its, uh, its you know, uh, Protestant heretical uh, declarations of people who don't come in line with its church? I don't think so. I think these people are uh, deluded, yes, that have joined. They, 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 they say the, pro the protest is over. I'm sure it says in this article here somewhere that the protest is over. Um, an edition of the 95 Thesis printed in Basel in 1517, the academic dispute on indulgences literally lit the fuse of the Reformation. Well, it was more than just indulgences. They, they still do have indulgences, you know, in the Catholic Church. Um, they also have uh, works, you know, works as an indulgence. Like you can, you can climb up the, the pilot stairs on your knees. And by doing that work, you may gain some favor in heaven. Or you can pray to this or that saint, you know, because they were so good in their life. They have, they have extra abundance of grace. And all, the same thing with, with, uh, you know, the queen of heaven. Yeah. She has an extra abundance of grace so that you can tap into her grace for the, you know, the failings of your life. That's right. Because, uh, yeah, and all that uh, praying to saints, they uh, constantly usurp the position of Christ by all of their doctrines and their bloodless sacrifice of transubstantiation. The scripture plainly says that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. So it's by Christ's blood alone, not by anything the priest pretends to do while he's there with his silver cup of wine and little rice wafer tablets uh, that he places on your tongue, uh, but he don't let you drink the wine because you ain't holy enough. That's right. You are not holy enough. Anyway, Catholics and Protestant leaders have stressed their mutual bonds 500 years after the start of the Reformation, a movement that tore apart Western Christianity and sparked a string of bloody religious wars in Europe lasting more than a century. Well, that's, that's, you know, that's a total lie, but that's the one they want to tell. That, oh, look what Martin Luther did. And the Reformation did nothing but bring about bloodshed. No, the blood was being shed before the Reformation started. Ask the Albigenses, the Waldenses, ask, ask the pre-Reformation church. The true church, the church of the inner court, uh, who was the Antichrist? They discovered when Antichrist was hunting them down and killing them and trying to wipe them off the face of the earth for not capitulating to the church, to the vicar of Christ on earth. That's right. The bloody war started. And uh, so this is a total lie, this article here. Uh, a movement that tore apart Western Christianity and sparked a string of bloody religious wars. And uh, the truth is, you know, the, there there were some so-called Protestants not really in the inner court that would fight, um, that would use force in the kingdom of God. And anytime you use force in the kingdom of God, well, you're you're. It's a telltale sign that you're not really in the kingdom, whether you call yourself Protestant or Catholic. It was the true church that was dressed in sackcloth. Oh, they weren't dressed in armor, and they weren't dressed in the in the garb of uh, mortal warfare on earth. Yeah, they were dressed in sackcloth. So a service in Westminster Abbey on Tuesday marked the anniversary date of 1517, which German theologian Mark, uh, Martin Luther submitted the 95 Thesis. 
to the Archbishop of Mainz, as well as nailing a copy to the door in Wittenberg, lighting the fuse of the Reformation. Individualism, division, cruelty, and war. In his address, Webley said, the text acknowledged the religious, political, and social changes triggered by Luther, but also the Reformation's dark side, including individualism, division. Oh, individualism, that's... that's uh, see, we are all individually saved. We all individually stand before God. He individually applies his blood to us. So individualism is not a bad thing. Yeah. Division. Oh, well, there was plenty of division and cruelty and war. There was plenty of cruelty and war already. Yes, going on for centuries. For each of the things that came through the Reformation, good as they are, precious beyond compare, even for each there is also a dark side, he said. When new vigor came conflict, with individual understanding of grace came individualism and division. With literacy and freedom came new ways of cruelty refined by science. With missionaries bearing the faith came soldiers bearing the flag. Okay, well, this all sounds like Pope speak to me. This is exactly what, what the Antichrist would have you believe. And when you seek Protestants, they're not Protestants, really. If you're not protesting, you're not really a Protestant. You're a Protestant in name only. It's like the picture of the church, the temple scene in, in chapter 11 of the Revelation. You're in the outer court. You know, you're a nominal in name only. You're only invisibly called a Christian, but you are not the true. Okay, we're going to, uh, uh, jump into the next couple articles when we come back from these messages. You're listening to Cross the Border, our Prophecy Reality Edition, so uh, don't go anywhere. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on Internet or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for missionary radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. Then, when you subscribe, we will send you the last quarterly MP3 CD of that program immediately and continue to do so with each new quarter. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host cause and anywhere else the spirit may lead you do all to the glory of our god and creator for his holy nation the only kingdom that will last forever thank you for listening Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, -S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. When it comes to prophecy today, much of the evangelical Christian world has their eyes on Israel, waiting and watching to see when the third temple will begin to be built. The plans are drawn. The Jewish people are eager. 
Most evangelical Christians today believe that the rapture will happen before the third temple is built. Hi, I'm Michael Eugene. I was taught that Daniel's 70th week was in the future. Is that really what the Bible teaches? Have we searched the scriptures and found this to be true? Why is it so important for a re-established Israel to build a third temple in Jerusalem? Is it necessary to build a temple on the same location already occupied by the Dome of the Rock? Is it necessary for sacrifices to take place in the temple on Temple Mount? Is there really a rapture followed by seven years of tribulation? What is the New Testament temple? Can we identify history and prophecy? Who is the first beast in Revelation chapter 13? Who are the seven kings in Revelation 17? I have asked all these questions and I have found Nicholas Arthur's new book, When the Third Temple is Built, answers all these questions and more using scripture to interpret scripture. The Bible says that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. Nicholas shows us in his new book, When the Third Temple is Built, how the Bible interprets prophecy and not man's private interpretation. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. Welcome back. You're listening to Cross Border. This is our Prophecy Reality Edition. And uh, I was checking out the chat room. Looks like I uh, got some questions there. Has Satan already been thrown out of heaven? And what is the half hour of silence? Uh, thanks, Nicholas. You know, I really have to uh, research that, Naughty Pines. I uh, uh, wish I'd have had that last week. If you could email that to me so I don't forget it. Because I really would like to uh, answer those questions for you. But I hate doing things off the top of my head because it's too easy to make errors that way. But I will look into that, Naughty Pines. And uh, we'll maybe get back to it next week. Let's see, Blue Raven. Oh, which translation do you consider most accurate and reliable uh, from Blue Raven? Well, I'm going to tell you. Uh, most accurate and reliable, I guess, would be the original uh, Texas Receptus, if you could get all the pieces together and uh, and read it in the Greek. But I think uh, the most reliable English version we have is probably what you're asking. What I would I would say would be the uh, authorized King James Version or the King James Version, either way. But I'm going to say the authorized King James Version um, simply because you can get it with the uh, the Greek and Hebrew tied to it. You can get a free copy uh, from, uh, where, where is that at? Um, what is that called? Yes, uh, eSword. E-Sword.net. And that's your e-version of it. And when you download the program, you get the King authorized King James Version with the Greek and Hebrew. Uh, and that way you mouse over a word and uh, you can see the appearance, the original language. And uh, so I think that's the best English version we have would be the authorized King James Version. And uh, yes, it's written at an eighth grade level. All of the newer are supposed to be easier versions. Well, they've rated them and they're all at a higher grade level than the King James Version. So all of their arguments, I believe, are Jesuit arguments just to get you away from the authorized King James Version Bible. That, that's my suspicion, and I'm sticking with it. Um, let's see. Oh yeah, Naughty Pine says, we have a uh, extra, extra large edition. We do. I don't have it with me. I got it over in my house. I use it there. But it comes in two volumes. It's uh, 14, uh, size 14 type. So it's extra, extra large, and it's it's in two volumes, but it is nice. Okay, all right, we we're going to continue uh, uh, the articles we were looking at, and like I said, I'll get to some of those questions next, or those questions from Naughty Pines next week. I will definitely look into them. 
Um, I was still looking at the same article here, so I'm, I'm going to jump back into that. I think this is uh, kind of important. Prayers were said by representatives of the Protestant churches and by Cardinal Vincent Nichols, the Archbishop of Westminster and leader of the Catholic Church in England and Wales. Yes, went all the way to, uh, to say prayers. He said, in Wittenberg, the German Chancellor, Angela Merkel, and President Frank Walter Steinmeier took part in a service in the Castle Church where Luther supposedly nailed the 95 Thesis. The city also celebrated the anniversary with medieval-style street festival, which included arts and Last week, Pope Francis said, Catholic and Protestants are now enjoying a relationship of true fraternity. Okay. Catholics and protesters. <laughs> yeah, we go ahead. Believe what the Antichrist says based on mutual understanding, trust, and cooperation. He told Derek Browning, moderator of the Church of Scotland, who was visiting the Vatican as part of the Reformation commemorations. So we, now we're visiting the, Re, Re, the, the Vatican as part of Reformation commemorations that the two traditions were no longer adversaries after long centuries of estrangement and conflict. The pontiff added, for so long we regarded one another from afar, all too humanly harboring suspicion, dwelling on differences and errors, and with hearts intent on recrimination for past wrongs. And I think we have one more. Um, Catholics and Protestants mark 500th anniversary of Martin Luther's Reformation. So you kind of get the idea here. And that, uh, that in the media, the mainstream media, this is your outer court, uh, church area here, whatever is most popular. And, uh, the, Pope Francis, Pontifical Council for Promoting Christian Unity, and the Lutheran World Federation, a global network of Lutheran churches, issued a joint statement on October 31st expressing thanks for the spiritual and theological gifts received through the Reformation. <laughs> yes, they discovered Christ, and they discovered Antichrist. Let us, let, let us be thankful. That we know who the biblical and historical Antichrist is. I agree. Yes, we should be thankful for that discovery. And uh, anyway, see all the pictures of the Catholic, the Pope there, and uh, let's see, President of the Lutheran World Federation, Bishop Munib Yunan. I guess that's the guy that, that looks like a Catholic priest there in the picture with, of course, sitting by the Antichrist. But, oh, we're over here with our Queen of Heaven and praying to saints and crawling on our knees on the pilot stairs and transubstantiation. And it's all okay. Yes. Forget about, you know, faith alone. The, the five solas of the refer that came out of the Reformation. Yeah. Forget all of that. They're going to celebrate Eucharist, the Eucharist together, despite the theological differences about the nature of this sacred Christian ritual. Okay, so they minimalize the Reformation and what really happened. Okay, let's see our final article here. Um, finally, Israel officially calling for a third temple to replace the Al-Aqsa Mosque. Oh, this is the uh, third temple to replace the Al-Aqsa Mosque. Not the Dome of the Rock, but the Al-Aqsa Mosque. That's interesting. I guess maybe they think that would be a bit easier target if they tear down the Al-Aqsa Mosque and instead of the Dome of the Rock. And uh, see, the Israel Minister of Housing and Construction Yuri Ariel on Friday expressed his wish. It's a wish now. It's now it's a wish <laughs> to see the 
construction of a third temple in place of the Al-Aqsa Mosque that is currently occupying the Temple Mount. Occupying yeah, the Temple Mount. Uh, uh, the first temple was destroyed in 586 BCE, the second temple in 70 CE. And ever since, the Jewish people have been mourning its loss. Well, I guess he doesn't know about the official stand that there's only 490 years from desolation to desolation in the Jewish calendar because he gives the right dates here between the uh, uh, the destruction of the temples. and It's more than 400, 490 years. Yeah. Anyway, that's you can read about that in my What Year Is It? I cover the Jewish calendar error. And uh, that's a funny thing. They just left it out uh, about 160 years out of their calendar, and it's right in there, right between uh, 486 B.C. and 70 C.E., the, the Jewish calendar that they use today left out 160 years. But there it is. You count those years, and it's, it's uh, about 160 more than uh, 490, if I'm, if I'm yeah, something like that anyway. He went on to say the Al-Aqsa Mosque is currently in the place of the temple, despite the temple being much holier than it. Well, the temple isn't there. How can it be much holier? The Al-Aqsa Mosque is only the third. You know, and the Al-Aqsa Mosque is not holy at all. It's a temple to demons, uh, especially, I guess, the moon god, Allah, the one who has no son. <laughs> Remember, Allah has no son. Yeah, but... Uh, so it's not the same God. We don't share the same God, you know, uh, despite what that guy Warren, that pastor who decided to back Krizlov said, oh, we have the same God. Uh-uh. Their God doesn't have a son. Our God had a son <clears throat> and has a son still. Yeah, so two different gods. One has a son and one does not. The Al-Aqsa Mosque is only the third most holy temple mosque in Islam. Now that Israel has once became a Jewish uh, sovereign state, the desire to rebuild the temple is growing stronger and stronger, he added. I guess, I guessing that's the t entire article. Okay, well, uh, I guess it's a wish. They're wishing that, uh, that's what it boils down to is a wish. You got a, like a one paragraph article there. But uh, wish, that's the, his wish to see the construction of a third temple. And it may happen, and it may not happen. We'll see. Likely that somehow it will happen. Uh, there is a, uh, it's more likely that they're not going to destroy the Al-Aqsa Mosque, but they're going to come up with a compromise. Um, there's a, uh, the God's Holy Mountain Vision. You can, you can Google that wrote about that in my book a little bit, when the third temple is built. Uh, still, there is no prophecy in the entire uh, Old or New Testament about rebuilding a third temple. Now, there are allusions in some Old Testament prophecy uh, to a temple that hasn't been built yet, but I believe that temple will be built, uh, you know, or represents uh, Jerusalem after the return of Christ for his millennial reign. So there is no third temple. It's not something that we know is going to happen. It's something they're trying to make happen, but it will not really not be a temple like the first two temples uh, because by their own doctrine, uh, they're not going to allow a sacrifice and oblation um, to take place on the Temple Mount. Okay. And uh, they're going to break the treaty in the midst of the week and not allow it, supposedly according to left-behind eschatology, that speculation. Okay, that's that article. You listen to Cross Border, that's our Prophecy Reality Edition. And in the second hour, we're going to jump back into History Unveiling Prophecy, the this book here, and you can get a copy of it. We've finally gone into publication worldwide on this with our final edit, final approved copy. And uh, you can also get a free copy. Go to my website, crossborder.org. There's a free ebook 
tab there. So you click on that, follow the instructions, and then you request History Unveiling Prophecy or any of the books that we publish at Cross the Border Publishing. Okay. That's, uh, Al says another recommended reading, Bible Symbols Decoded. Well, that might be something like this book. I don't know. Is that anything like Key to the Apocalypse? which is a subtitle, The Seven Divine Interpretations of Symbolic Prophecy for Understanding the Apocalyptic Code. Uh, but basically, this is a great little book that you should have. And uh, this was actually, when uh, when H. Grattan wrote this book, um, he talked about the book he was going to write next, which was this book. <laughs> so these are kind of companion books, basically. But he goes through the uh, seven divine interpretations of his symbolic prophecy. And that is the, in the prophecies where God gives the prophecy and then he gives the interpretation. And we use that as our school text uh, to, to teach us how to interpret symbolic prophecy. Does that make sense? If God gave us his word, and he gave us a method for interpreting symbolic prophecy in his word, then we need to pay attention. And that's what uh, is outlined in this book, Key to the Apocalypse. This is also available on my website at crosstheborder.org. And so you should take advantage of this. But this is very eye-opening. You want to read this like a dozen times. This is just a little thing, man. You know, it's like a hundred pages of large print. Anytime you get... In, into a book and it's less than 100 pages, just make the print larger, larger so you can use all 100 pages because that's the minimum you pay for 100 pages whether you use it or not. Did you know that? I found that out. So anything less than 100 pages, I just make the print larger to fill it up to the 100 page minimum. So anyway, but get that. Um, key to the Apocalypse. And once you read this, It'll open your eyes to understanding all the symbols of prophecy because God has already given us the meanings of most of the symbols. And uh, uh, other than that, if like in the Revelation, uh, there are some prophecies given where he doesn't give us an interpretation. But if you understand the prophecies where he does give us interpretation, you understand how to interpret the prophetic symbols that God uses. So that's, you know, it isn't this future, future speculation or astrology or astronomy like all of the September 23rd hoopla that was going on for a year. People were all excited that the rapture was going to happen on September 23rd because of the alignment of the stars. And they read chapter 12 where it appeared to be you know, I mean, if you wanted it to be astrological, but see, nowhere in any of the, uh, where God gives us any of the interpretations of the symbolic prophecies that he gives us in the scripture, does he use astrology to interpret them? So I discarded that just, you know, right away. I said, no, 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 no. We're going to do it God's way. We're going to interpret we're going to interpret prophecy the way that God teaches us in his word. We're going to use the school text he gave us. And you start with Daniel chapter 2, you know, and there's a prophecy given uh, in Nebuchadnezzar's dream. And right away, Daniel gives the interpretation of the prophecy. Lesson number one in interpreting symbolic prophecy. And then there, so there are seven divinely given interpretations, just like Daniel chapter two, throughout Daniel and the Revelation. And when you understand all of those, then you go, aha, that's how I'm supposed to interpret these symbols. All of the clues are in God's word. And that's why all the symbols that you'll find in the Revelation, you'll find throughout the scripture and especially in the Old Testament. And they give you a clue as to their meaning. And if you want some help, you can always get this book, History on Daily Prophecy by H. Grant and Guineas, or this book here, uh, The Last Prophecy, which is an abridgment of the Hore Apocalyptica by E.B. Elliott. Uh, 
a, a an abridgment of a 2,500 page uh, master work on the Revelation, one of the most exhaustive works ever done on the Revelation. <clears throat> So I hope, uh, Al, that uh, Bible Symbols Decoded is is a historicist view. He says, I'll check that out, studio. Um, oh, he says, is a historicist view of Daniel and the Revelation. Well, I'll have to check that out. Send me a link to that. I'll uh, find, go to my website and put a link in the comments there. And I'd appreciate that. And I'll check it out. Bible Symbols Decoded. I was looking for more good uh, um, historicist interpretation and and uh, always to gain another uh, view on, on especially the symbology, the, the understanding the symbol views in prophecy. Um, Al, we are the temple. That's right, we are the temple. Destroy this temple in three days and I will raise it up. That's what Jesus said. He changed the... I mean, the temple was on the ground, but... This is the only thing Jesus taught about the temple. Um, but the only prophecy he gave, Jesus actually gave of the temple, was of its destruction in the Gospels. You can read about it. His only prophecies of the temple were its destruction. You know, why didn't Paul, who said, the man of sin sitting in the temple of God showing himself, why didn't he tell us that this temple was going to be rebuilt if it was? No. Because... What did Paul teach us before he said that? He said, you are the temple of God. So, let's see. CFF says, CCF says, I've wondered if they will just use the Al-Aqsa Mosque. Now it's, <laughs> it's unclean. They can't do it. They have to actually build a, a new temple building. They can't use an unclean thing like the Al-Aqsa Mosque. Uh, the third temple, in my view, was and is the body of Christ. It is not a physical structure. Yes and amen. I'll say that. Uh, I'll agree with that. No doubt about it. How does the son of perdition sit in the temple if the temple is people? Sitting in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. He, he sits in the... He takes the place of Christ in the hearts of my, and minds of men and women on earth. And that's the symbology being used. If, if we are the church, we are the temple, and him sitting in the temple is taking the place. And that's what the Antichrist does even today. The protest is not over. Well, I want to thank you all for listening. Uh, may the Almighty bless each and every one of you as you continue in his kingdom day by day. Visit crossthborder.org C-R-O-S-S crossthborder.org to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. That's crossthborder.org. I know you all want answers, and believe me, so do I, and I'll do my best to get them. Despite Nicholas Cage's promise to do his best to get left behind rapture answers for us, don't hold your breath. Not everyone believes left behind is true prophecy. Some may even regard as conspiratorial the mainstream re-release of the Left Behind movie with actor Nicolas Cage portraying the main character as an attempt to further reinforce in the minds of all this perception of false prophecy in order to condition the masses for the play about to begin. If you want true Bible prophecy answers, get the book, The Rapture Will Be Cancelled. The author exposes the Latin rapture origin the seven-year tribulation deception, true Bible revelation of Daniel's 70 weeks, the abomination of desolation, the restrainer, America in the revelation, the image of the beast and the mark of the beast, and the truth about God's chosen people, and so much more about Bible prophecy. This book will shatter 
the left behind paradigm of future events. Get the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. Visit crosstheborder.org, C-R-O-S-S, crosstheborder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. That's crosstheborder.org. The book of Revelation says, The spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus Christ. This is at the very heart of FirstAmendmentRadio.com. In that spirit, we have created the Prophecy Reality News app for all of your mobile devices. Streaming First Amendment Radio 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Available for your Apple, Android device, and smartphone absolutely free. Get the Prophecy Reality News app installed today so you can listen to First Amendment Radio wherever you are. The Prophecy Reality News app. Get it now.